Okay, we're rolling. This is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 9th of December, 2004, approximately 1230. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Yeah, my name is Kenneth C. Sparks. I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on January 2nd, 1925. I'll be 80 in January. Okay. What was your uh, educational background prior to entering service? Uh, I was a senior in high school when the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor, and the guys are dropping out of school like flies because they're anxious to get into the, into the most of them were not good students. And they figured they'd rather go in the Marine Corps and, and stay in high school. <laughs> so a lot of the guys volunteered and they went away. But my mother says, you're not going anywhere until you graduate. I was only 17. Mm -hmm. and so, in fact, I just got 17 after Pearl Harbor. And I was a senior. And so she says, you're not going anywhere until you graduate. But because at that time, my older brother, Harold, he was a fighter pilot in the Army Air Corps. And he was over in, in England. And uh, so she says, you're not going anywhere until after you graduated. So I graduated. And then she said, no, you're not going to go anywhere until after Christmas. I was still 17, and my brother was overseas, and she didn't want me to go. Mm -hmm. And so I worked in the shoe store for all that summer, and finally, the, the day after Christmas, I got my dad, and we went up to Utica, and I went to the armory in the, the, uh, the post office, probably, and the Navy had a recruiting office, and I, I joined the Navy. And they sent me to Albany for a few days where I got sworn in, and I had to take a physical or what have you, and I remember that, I, uh, that, they, that, that they kept me overnight at the YMCA in Albany because they said, you've got an irregular heartbeat. Well, I didn't know that. And so uh, I stayed overnight at the YMCA, and the next day I went back, and they said, okay, your, your heart's all right. So anyway, the, the payoff on that is that now, all these years later, I had a pacemaker put in two years ago because uh -huh. the doctor said I have a irregular heartbeat. I, and that's the same irregular heartbeat I had when I was 17. <laughs> and so they said, no, no, there's more to it now. So anyway, they, they, they put a pacemaker in me. But that, that's okay, the, well, I'll go back a little bit. Um, do you remember where you were and your reaction and how you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, I was out with a bunch of my buddies. We all had 22 rifles. Oneida High School. We went out somewhere, I don't remember where, and one of the guys had his dad's car. And so we're out shooting whatever we could find to shoot at out in the farmlands. And so uh, anyway, we got back in the car freezing to death. And Howard turns on the radio, and the Japs have just hit Pearl Harbor. What the heck? Where the heck is Pearl Harbor? Not one of us knew where Pearl Harbor was. And I find that was very common. Yes, it was. And so anyway, uh, I get home, and my dad's all upset because he was, you know, he was, old, he was, he was alive, but not in World War One. And so he knew what what this meant. And, you know, it was, it was going to be a big war. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I, I kept on going to school, and I know that the guy... The, now, when you enlisted in the Navy, why did you select the Navy? Uh, well, th two reasons. Uh, number one, when I was in high school, I read every Navy book in the, in the library. I just liked it, okay? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, gee, I'd like to be in the Navy. But then when my brother, my older brother, got to be a fighter pilot, I thought maybe... I'd like to be a pilot, okay? Mm -hmm. Be a big hero, hot dog. And so uh, when I joined the Navy, the guy, the recruiting guy said, well, he said, I won't guarantee you that you'll get into the flight training, but you can apply for it. And somewhere along the line, they told me that the flight program is all filled, which mm -hmm. it possibly was. Mm -hmm. you know, I have to, yeah, there were times they had too many guys in the yeah. pilot training. Yeah. And so I went to the Navy and uh, I went to Samson boot camp. Now, where, where, when did you enlist? Oh, I enlisted on the de December 26th of 1941. <clears throat> okay. And I, looked at, I went, they sent me home, and I got a telegram to report back on December, or February 5th of 1942. And I went to Samson. Mm -hmm. Samson was the Navy training base. Right, now, what did it look like when you went there? You must have been one of the first group to go there. Well, as a matter of fact, we were not... Samson just opened up a few right. months prior. You're aware of that? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, we had a brand new barracks. And the barracks were quite nice, except mm -hmm. the, the, being right on that lake, I'll tell you, it was cold. And the barracks were quite, were quite often cool, but it was, it was fine. I'm, I'm 18. There's probably 100 guys in that company, mm -hmm. and we're all 18 
right out of high school, all green, never been away before. A lot of us were from the, from the central New York area, you know, Utica and Rome and Oneida and Syracuse and what have you. And we went through the typical basic training, which involved a lot of athletics and calisthenics and classes, sanitary, uh, taking care of yourself and what mm -hmm. have you. I, I remember that the, they gave us all our issue of clothing. In the Navy, you all got the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like One thing was four sets of underwear, shorts and, and skinny uh, t-shirts, and a couple of sh dungaree shirts and dungarees and your undress blues and your dress blues and a pair of shoes, one pair of shoes, and socks, whatever. And I kept throwing my dirty laundry in the locker. And I finally said to somebody, what do you do with your dirty laundry? <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe my mother would come and do it. See? <laughs> So you get a goddamn pail and you wash your own laundry. So I learned then that you have to get a pail of water and you take some. So they give you the soap and you wash your laundry and you have a place where you hang it up to dry. So I learned that. But th th that was good, good to learn that because when you went aboard ship, you, we had a laundry on our ship, but our ship was so old that it was not very good, and so most of us washed our own clothes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, at one time in the in the in the gym they when we first got there they had us they took a test on us our, our, our abilities our, mm -hmm. our, the, the, our physical condition right. how many pull-ups can you do you count them okay and how many sit-ups can you do? I know I did as many sit-ups as I could possibly do and the the next day the whole company were all sore because we all overdid ourselves mm -hmm. people wanted to look good right and God, we were moaning and groaning around that place but then our chief who was in charge of our chief petty officer was in charge of the company he was a uh, had formerly in high school had been a uh, an athletic coach and so he used to run our pants off every place we went we ran and we did exercises and we played basketball. I, I can remember with the, the one time we go into the gym and they put the boxing gloves on every one of us. And we're just supposed to run around hitting, hitting, each, <laughs> hitting each other. And they, they really worked us out. Of course, I'm 18 and I was probably sloppy. Mm -hmm. uh, they did a lot for me, physically and mentally, I think. Mm -hmm. And when I went in the Navy, I weighed 130 pounds. I was almost six feet tall. I was uh, a real skinny nerd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I got out, I weighed 160. So, How long were you at Samson? Eight weeks. Mm -hmm. I came home on a leave for a week probably. And uh, I remember that the Oneida where I lived is where the headquarters of Troop D State Police is. And uh, one of the lieutenants, Lieutenant Perry in the State Police, he was, lived right down the street and he and my dad were good friends. And so uh, when, when I went to boot camp, he said to me, Kenny, he says, uh, I'm going to tell you how you keep your hair when you get in the Navy. And I said, they cut it all off. He said, I want you to take a cigar box. <laughs> so anyway, he, we, were, we were friends. And so anyway, I'm home on leave. And, and he said, Kenny, he says, uh, how are you going to get back? I said, well, I'll probably take a train. And he said, I'll take you back. Well, he was lieutenant. And so he used to go all around Troop D visiting the substations. Mm -hmm. And there, Troop D included Geneva and Canada. Went down that way. And so he drove me back through uh, Auburn, down Route 5, if you know the area. Mm -hmm. And we came up to the main gate at Sampson, and I wondered what the, what he's going to do now. So he drove right up to the gate, put the window down. He was in uniform, and the, the, the guard didn't even ask any questions. He just he should have asked why he had me in the car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that was quite a nice experience. But then I, I or, or during boot camp, uh, well, they gave us all kinds of uh, instructions on health, VD, mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. And then we had the, the, the they had they gave us a chance to select what trade we wanted to go into, because the Navy is big on trades. Mm -hmm. And so an electrician's mate does this, and a bosun's mate does that, and an engine room man does this, and a radio man does this, and a yeoman does that. And so they came down to the fire controlman, and they said the qualifications to become a fire controlman is that you have to be adept at math. Well, I was a math major in high school, so I thought that's right up my alley. And so uh, I put down my first choice was fire control school. Excuse me. And uh, I put down a second choice, aviation metalsmith or whatever, because th th then you could be a, maybe get on an airplane, like mm -hmm. a dive bomber or something mm -hmm. like that. And so uh, sure enough, I get back from boot camp and I've been assigned to fire control school. 
And so they ran a train right in the right in the Sampson, the Navy base. I, I don't know what rail line, the railroad it was. It was the one that went down across the southern, the southern tier, Binghamton or what have you. And we got on that troop train. Oh God, there's a whole train load of us going to various places. And so uh, I guess maybe we tra changed trains somewhere. And I, I remember we were going up through the uh, the uh, co on the when we got to the Atlantic coast. All the shades were drawn on the for blackout, mm -hmm. except the, job, the subs are out there, and so we pulled in the we pulled into Providence around midnight on the train, and so they had buses waited for a whole bunch of us were being transferred to Newport. Newport was a big education center for recruits, and so we got on those buses, and I remember we went out to the barracks. It was like two or three in the morning, and the company that was leaving hadn't left yet. And so they were all sleeping in their hammocks. Now, at Sampson, we had double-decker bunks. It's, at Newport was an old-fashioned Navy base, and they had hammocks. And you string your hammock up from that beam to this beam. Mm -hmm. And so we went in there, and all these guys are sleeping. And so we had never strung a hammock. And it, was a, it was a laugh, really, because we tried to string our hammocks in between the existing guys. And uh, most of us didn't know how to tie the knots properly. I, I didn't have any trouble because I was I was good at Boy Scouts too on uh, knots and that kind of stuff. And so we, we tried to get in those darn hammocks. It was the funniest thing. Well, the the, the guys left the, the other class who had just finished fire control school. They left the next day, and then we started. We had four months of I mean a lot of a lot of classroom work. We we had to know trigonometry, which I did anyway, and they they would teach us how to what a gun director does. You've seen pictures of the gun directors. They're probably three times bigger than this table and all the cranks that were on them. Mm -hmm. This is before the day of radar. And so uh, what a situation would come up where you've got a, an enemy ship is, is dead ahead at, at, at estimated 12 miles. Okay, so you, 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 you dial, you do, by trig trigonometry you, you draw it up and you draw triangles. And so uh, we're where it's where it's such a 90 degree heading, and the target's at 360 degrees, and the wind is blowing at so and so speed. Where do we aim the gun so that when we fire the shell, the shell will hit the the ship? Mm -hmm. And also we do that with airplanes too. A plane is coming in at estimated 10,000 feet, and so we'd have to we do by mathematic what that computer does in an instant. Okay. And we did that. We had a lot of electric work because we had to maintain the uh, the gun con or the the drive trains on the motor on the the, the uh, guns. Uh, all guns are they're, they're power operated. Any, anything from a th from a three inch up is, is operated by electric power. And so we had to learn all DC power. We had to learn about a, a lot of electricity. So anyway, we were there for four months and uh, got out. And uh, ironically, I think there was about 90 guys in the class. And we were from New England, all from the East. And the, the top third of the class got, they made fire controlman third class. That's the third class petty officer. <coughs> the, the second third of the class, they gave you a promotion from seaman second class to seaman first class. And the lowest guys, they stayed at seaman second class. So the guys that were in, in, in the uh, uh, first group that got their rating, they all went as a group to San, San Diego for advanced fire control school. My best friend, John Simpson, who I got a Christmas card from yesterday, uh, he and I were tied to be the first guy in the second section. We missed by a fraction of a percentage point of going with the first group and getting a third class rating. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, <laughs> then, then the the the, uh, the lowest group they were sent to some uh, either pier th pier ninety two in New York or somewhere just to be assigned to a ship, generally. Okay, mm -hmm. except they'd been to fire control school, so that showed on their records. So John and I get orders to go to pier ninety two in New York City. <coughs> I should I shouldn't drag this out. I'll no, be that's here all not, day. That's fine. So John and I he went home to Pittsburgh and I went home to Oneida. And then. Uh, then we, we, we met down at Pier 92 in New York City, which is a big receiving station. And it was, it was well known because it was a terrible place. And Walter Winchell used to write articles about it in the paper 
about how bad it was. It was really bad. You didn't dare leave anything laying around to be stolen. And so we get orders when they, well, they put us on work parties. And so we did this and we did that. We, I'm not going to tell you about the work parties. And so we, one, one day we look at the bulletin board, Sparks and Simpson, their serial number, uh, report to the U.S. Navy torpedo testing range in Montauk, Long Island. I said, hey, we're going to be right here in New York. So we get the train ticket or whatever it was, and we went down to the train station, and we get on the train. Montauk, New York is at the very end of Long Island. Four hours by train to get out to Mont Montauk Point. The train comes to the end of the line, okay, and there's a big hotel up on the hill there, not a very big hill. It was a hotel called the Montauk Manor. Well, the Navy had taken it over. And so the testing range was uh, the, the, the submarines from New London would come out in the, in the Long Island Sound and, and fire torpedoes, and then these guys would pick them up to analyze them. They'd go out in boats and they'd the, the, the torpedoes they could find, some, whatever reason. And so we get a ride up to the to the, the hotel, we go in the lobby, and there's a desk there, and somebody says, the OD is there, and uh, he looks at our records, and he says, fire control, and he says, what are you guys doing here? How do we know? You know, we're 18 years old, we got orders to come here. And so he says to another guy, what are we going to do with them? And so they made us what they called compartment cleaners, which meant that we, we had a room in the hotel, which was nice, our own bathroom, but we had to sweep the lobby, wash all the windows, scrub the paintwork, we were the janitors, and so we did this for about two months, and, uh, and uh, I, I was really, we, both of us were really teed off about that. So one day we got up enough nerve, and, and if you're ever in the Navy, you have captain's mast, and that's when you can go, or commander's mast, and then you can go up to see the officer and, and ask for a, a leave or a weekend off or what have you. Mm -hmm. And so we went to see this guy. He was a reserve officer. He was a commander, probably a businessman who went into the Navy just to do something, but there was war going on. And we explained to him that we'd gone to fire control school and we were trained as fire controlmen and we're wasting our time here. We want to get in the fleet. Good, uh, good, good reasoning. He says, I'll see this taken care of. Well, a day or so later, we got orders to go to the USS New York in uh, Norfolk. So we get a ride down to Norfolk on the train or whatever you and we went to the receiving station in, in Norfolk, and we check in. The New York sets out at sea. Oh, cripes. Now we have to sit and wait for who knows how long. So a day or two later, we get a notice that the, the New York is down to the Navy Yard, and they were to re report aboard. So they, somehow they got us down to this dirty old ship. <laughs> and it was in the Navy Yard, and they, they were working on it. And so there was uh, electric wires all over the place and, and welding going on, and like that. What are we doing here in this tub? So we go aboard, and, uh, and there's a lieutenant, Le Leonard Smith, Lenny Smith. He was, the he was the officer of the deck. And he says, hey, you guys went to fire control school. He said, I'm the fire control officer. I'm going to put you right in my division. So we went right into the fire control division, which is a, most guys when you go aboard, they stick you on a deck division. And those are the guys that you see scrubbing the decks. Okay, And they, they man the big guns during in, in the battles. And so we got right in the fire control division and uh, after a short time uh, we both we both made third class petty officer. And so the, the ship was in the, at that time had just gone on training duty. It had come back from the African campaign and it was put on training duty and every week we would pick up oh hundreds of, uh, of uh, guys out of boot camp. And they'd come, they'd come aboard our ship and we'd teach them how to shoot guns and they would teach them electric, or it was, it was a school ship. Mm -hmm. They'd be aboard for like three weeks. And also we were, we were instructing uh, uh, boot ensigns. You know what a boot ensign is? Just got, just got his, his 90 day wonders. You know, the officers that go to college and they get a mm -hmm. midshipman school. And when they get out of the midshipman school, they don't know anything about sea duty. And so we get a group, groups of them would come aboard for a couple of weeks and they teach them whatever their <coughs> work is. Mm -hmm. And this was so boring because every fr every Monday morning we'd go out, and every Friday afternoon we'd come back into Norfolk, and, and the USS Wyoming, which was a an ex ex battleship that had, had had virtually all its guns taken off, and they had the big disarmament after World War One, and so that was used as a training ship. 
in New York and the Wyoming used to race to get in first because the, whoever got in first could tie up at the naval operating base and the other one had to anchor out in, the, in Chesapeake Bay somewhere. And to go on leave out, when you're anchored out, you have to get on a whaleboat and they take you into the, into the uh, NOB, in the operating base. So we did this for almost a year. And, uh, now, when was the New York built? Was it a commission? Nineteen fourteen. I thought it was, yeah, pre World War One. Yeah. And it got at the, it was at the, uh, at the surrender of the German fleet, whatever that was called. Uh, it was there, representing the United States, mm -hmm. and the Texas was there also. That was our sister ship. So anyway, after a year of that, well, the, the final thing we did in Norfolk uh, in the summer of forty four. Yeah, 44. Uh, we went up to Annapolis three times and picked up like 600 mid midshipmen from the Naval Academy. And then we would go on a three week cruise from Annapolis down to Trinidad. And that was fun. The, the, by this time, the uh, Caribbean was free of German submarines. So we could go down through there safely. And we'd get down to the, the Trinidad and the, we'd fire guns. And the, the, there's a guy that I know in Casanova that is a retired. Pardon me, uh, he's a retired judge, and he was on one of those cruises. He said, God, he said, they put me down in the engine room, he said. And he said, we just about sweated our butts off down there. They were learning how they thought the engineering part of, it, of, the, of the ship. And so we used to teach them how to shoot guns and whatever. And so after three weeks, we go back up to Annapolis, drop them off, pick up six, three, 600 more. And we did that all for three trips. And then we got word that we're going to go to the Pacific. Boy, we just about celebrated. And so uh, we, we had some more work done on the ship, and then uh, we took a whole bunch of crew with us. We had a skeleton crew because we had to have room for the students. Mm -hmm. And so we, I think we took on five or, hundred, five, five or 600 recruits right out of boot camp, came aboard ship, and the, they were all right from Camp Perry where they had a Navy uh, boot camp. Most of them were from the South. A lot of them couldn't read or write. A lot of them didn't know what the shower was for. So being in the fire control division, they screened them. And the, the guys that we got, we maybe got a half a dozen or so of them. They were all high school graduates anyway, so they had pretty good knowledge. But most of them wound up in the, in the uh, deck divisions or down in the, as firemen in the uh, engine room somewhere. And so then we took off and we went down to... Yet we went with a, the, the, a couple more battleships. I think the Nevada and the Texas were with us. And we went down through the Caribbean, through the Panama Canal, and on up to uh, California, and then eventually out to Pearl Harbor. And the Pearl Harbor, uh, we pulled in there. I'll never forget it. We could see the remains of the ships that, like the Arizona, mm -hmm. was sunk and still is still there. And the other ships are still half submerged. They, after a short time, they got every one of them back in service except the Arizona mm -hmm. and the Utah, which was virtually a training ship anyway. So we were in Pearl Harbor for a short time, and uh, we did some more firing off in some island somewhere for some more gunfire training. And uh, of course, we always had a destroyer or two with us. And so then uh, we get orders to go somewhere. We didn't know where, so we were on the way. But we know we're going to go to a battle somewhere, but we didn't know where it was. And so we're sailing along, and one day the ship starts going like this, okay? So uh, they pulled into one of the islands somewhere, and they sent a diver down, and he found one of the blades was missing off of one of our screws. We had two screws, and each blade is, is about six feet high, mm -hmm. and they weigh tons. And so when that one blade came off, then the go like this and so that's why we were uh, vibrating so much so everybody's moaning and groaning about oh we'll have to go back to Pearl Harbor we knew we were going to some invasion somewhere and so then we the, they get orders for us to proceed as best we could and then we went into Okinawa no Iwo Jima the night before the, no, three days before the invasion and we fired all of our 14 inch shells and virtually all of our 5 inch shells at, the, at Iwo Jima Island and we would go in with, with, within a mile, which is point blank range. And we fired all those, uh, all that ammunition. Every now and then we'd hit something. We, like one day we hit a, a lucky hit. We hit a, uh, an ammunition dump, and the thing blew up. It was the biggest, biggest hit that I ever hit on the, uh, Iwo Jima. I was an anti-aircraft gunner. 
I was on about the 40 millimeters. I was a director on one of them, and, and so uh, I was able. I just sat there and uh, watched the whole thing because the, no planes came over. Mm -hmm. And the, the uh, when the th turret three, there's five turrets on, a ba on our battleship. My gun crew was from 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 turret three. So when their turret three is firing, I don't have a crew. So lots of times I didn't have a gun crew, so I'd wander around the ship. I'd go up in some place where I could get a good view and. And uh, so we, we, we spent three solid days there, and, and the Japs, and the, once or twice they'd open fire to shoot back at us. But the minute they did, one of our spotters would pinpoint it, and then we'd fire a couple of rounds and it'd be gone, just like that. But once they exposed themselves, we knew where they were. And so we pulled out of Pearl Harbor, and they we're going down to a place called Manus, Manus which is in the Admiralty Islands. It's down below the equator. There's, there was two floating dry docks down there which were gigantic. They were big enough to take in aircraft carriers, which were a thousand feet long. Our ship was 600 feet long. So uh, we go into the dry dock, and sure enough, right on the dry dock, there's a couple of blades there. The, or maybe, uh, I don't know whether they replaced the blades or put all new screws on. I don't really know. But we were there for maybe a week, and while they were doing that, they did some other work. And uh, we, they sent us over group by group. We could go to the beach and go swimming and give us a couple of cans of beer. And that's when you always wanted to have a friend that didn't drink beer. <laughs> and while we're there, thinking about it, uh, one, one day I'm on duty. I, I, th I think maybe we had the. Uh, I think maybe we had a couple of guns manned while we were down there because there were still Japs around. And so uh, I see a, an L LCVP. That's a landing craft, the ones that drop the mm -hmm. ramp. It comes alongside, and they got somebody in a basket. And so they came right along, under the crane. We had a crane on each side. And the, they pulled up a casket, and the, or a basket, and there was a guy in it. Well, it turns out he was one of our best friends. He was a first-class fire controlman. And he died the next day. And what had happened, he'd been out on, on, the, on the, wherever we, they took us to go swimming and have the beers. He, the, the LCVP comes in to pick him up, and he ran towards it, and he fell, and the ramp dropped, and landed right on him, and supposedly it spread eagled him like this. Mm -hmm. And the doctors couldn't save him. And so while we were down there, he, 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 had, he had just, he had a pregnant wife, we knew that. And he just, uh, I guess he just made first class. And so he died, and so we buried him at Iwo Jima, or at, uh, at uh, Manus. And that was one of the very sad things to have, have happened. That's the only guy that we lost in the war. And so after we get fixed up, we go up to, uh, Ulithi, which is a, one of the island groups, and that's where they used to form the fleets. Not to, not too far from Saipan, and so we pulled in there one morning, and I went up on the main deck, and I've never seen so many ships at one time in my life. As far as I could see, in all directions, there's there's old tankers, there's uh, transports, there's uh, battleships, aircraft carriers, and what have you. And we heard that all the one of the carriers had gotten hit that night by kamikaze. This is when the kamikaze was starting. So we were there for, I don't know how long, but uh, I have it probably in my diary. You're not supposed to keep a diary, but some of us did. Uh, so we pull out one day with just a couple of other ships, and what we found out was that we were on the way to Okinawa. And they sent us out first because we were slow. Those old battleships, we could only make, we cruised at 16... 17 knots. And the new ones cruise at like 30 knots. Mm -hmm. And the aircraft carriers are like 30 knots. And so they sent us out first with a bunch of old battleships. And we went up out to Okinawa. And uh, we're there the night before. And the, the Easter morning, April 1st, 1945, uh, we opened fire. And we fired all day 14 inch guns and 5 inch 51s. And never saw a Jap plane, nothing. We fired all day. They bring sandwiches around for lunch to all the gun crewmen. And we, we had a lot of gun crew. We, we had f f uh, 48 20 millimeters, and we had 10 quad mounts 40 millimeters, and we had 10 3 inch 50s. And so that's our air, anti aircraft battery. And so that's a lot of guys. And, and so we all, they all brought us food. And so uh, the, when I'm in my battle station, I'm in a tub. The tub is about waist high, probably about eight feet in diameter. 
and my director is right in front of me. He has high handlebars like a bicycle, and I would aim at the target, and my spotter would put in the estimated range. And, and if I'm firing, he watches the tracers, and he he uh, corrects right or left or up or down or whatever. And I keep I just keep that reticule right on the target, supposedly. And that little director that was in there, it was called a Mark 51 director, that automatically had gyroscopes in it. And that automatically is supposed to make it so if I'm on the target, and if he's got the right range in, and the right deflection right or left, theoretically I'll hit the plane, okay? But when they happen, it happens, it happens so quickly that you generally you just shoot and aim your tracers. So anyway, we, we never had a jab come over. And so Easter, it's Easter Day, and at, at sunset or whatever it was, they called, they, they put, they took us off of general quarters and put us on the first divisions on watch or the second division or the third division, meaning we manned maybe one third of the anti-aircraft guns. And the other two third, the other two, the other two sections, that's where they, section one, two, and three. The other section goes down below decks, take a shower if you want, and then section by section they give us our meal, and that night we had roast turkey dinner. If we had an Easter dinner, roast turkey and all the, all the uh, fixings for it. And then that, at 4, 8, and 12 is when the shifts change. You guys maybe know this. At 4, 8, and 12, the shift changes. So at 8 o'clock, the, the next division, would, the next section would go on watch, and the section that was on watch would be released, and then they come down and take a shower and get their meal. So we were there for 78 days. We did that every day. And we fired more. We shot, fired more shells at Okinawa than any any ship ever fired anywhere in the Pacific. And we got some kind of accommodation, which was not worth worth much. But we we got some accommodations. Oh, well, we got hit one night by a kamikaze. They, oh, almost every night, you'd, you'd be in your bunk sleeping if you're not on watch. And it comes over th uh, air defense, air defense, the bogies at so and so, and so you'd rush up to your battle station. And I my spotter. And I, he, my spotter was a bosun's mate, and I wish I could think of his name. He would put the headset on the telephones, and so we're waiting for word. word. And we, so oftentimes, we could hear planes flying around over us, but we never saw them. And our orders were to not fire unless you absolutely see a target, and, the, and, you're under, we're, and we are under attack. And so, uh, oftentimes, the I come over the phones, okay, secure from quarters. It was a, one of our planes forgot to turn on is what they called IFF, mm -hmm. Identification Friend or Foe. And they have some kind of a switch that would turn something on, and our radar would get that signal that it's a friendly plane. And some of these clowns would be flying around and they wouldn't have that IFF on properly. And then we'd be called out to quarters. And so one night we're on, 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 on a call, and uh, Pitch dark. I mean, a ship has maintained complete darkness, supposedly. And uh, <coughs> my battle station was right, right amidships, right in the middle, on the port side. Okay. And so uh, I, all of a sudden, I see some anti-aircraft tracers going up, and they're back here off the port quarter, and they're probably a mile or two away. And I didn't know what it was, but I thought, now this is something going on here. And so. Uh, Well, this happened a couple of times. So the one time it happened, uh, I looked and I could I could hear a plane, and then then for a split second or two I saw the exhaust, and this plane is just about ready to hit us, and so I flung I swung my director around, and, and of course wherever I had my director, that gun mount down there, he would go with it. There's ten guys on that gun mount, and so I squeezed my fire my fire trigger. And boom, 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 boom. We got probably eight or ten shots off, and that's the boat. I knew I didn't hit him. In fact, he flew right over and crashed. Flew right over the ship and crashed. I know I didn't hit him. So a minute goes by, and, the, and my spotter says, Hey, Sparks, he says, uh, they want you on the bridge. I thought, holy crap. I'm, I'm, I'm 20 years old. <laughs> and so I go up on the bridge, and the captain's there. He was a real SOB. Don't ask me. Ask anybody that comes to our reunions. And he says, was that you to open fire? I said, yes, sir. You know your orders were not to open fire unless you could see that, that, that we're under attack. I said, sir, I saw it coming, so I opened fire. Okay, you're dismissed. Just just like that. I was shaking my... <laughs> so anyway, some sometime later, it was April, whatever the date was. I have the date written down somewhere. 
uh, the, uh, we, another plane's coming in on us, and the ship over the other way, so we saw somebody else shooting at it, so then he came in on us, and uh, I didn't have a gun crew. My gun crew was in, in ter well, I, I must not have had a gun crew, because I, I, I was just standing there. And I, I'm standing, and I, I can hear something, and I can see the blue flames, and this plane came right in, and he went, here, here this picture, this is the main mast, foremast, and this is the main mast. And the catapult is right here, where the airplanes were. Uh -huh. And I'm right here. Well, that ship came, that airplane came in probably 40 feet from me. I could see it as it went by. And I'm standing there instead of ducking down behind the shield. And his wing, one wing hit here, and the other wing hit one of the planes on the, on the, on the catapult. And uh, the fuselage, he just went right through and splashed on the other side. So we wound up with two wings on the deck. That's how close it was. If he'd been 10 or 15 feet either right or left, he would have hit, hit the ship, and then he would have blown up because they, they blew up, and then mm -hmm. usually they carried a bomb, and then, of course, the fuel would explode. And so a lot of guys, including me, probably would have been killed or wounded. But just by a stroke of luck, he, just, he, he went right through and left his wings on board. And so uh, I, I, like a jerk, I jumped out of... My director was on top of a ammunition shack where they kept a 40 millimeter ammunition. It's about eight feet high, and so I jumped down on the main deck with my pair of pliers and I tore a tore a piece of aluminum off of the wing. <laughs> and you can see that I had the red part of the red ball, and I went back at my battle station. We, we were most of the guys that I know did that. <laughs> you know, it was our first operation. <laughs> And guys were famous for trying to get <coughs> souvenirs, and that's uh -huh. how a lot of guys get killed. Uh -huh. So I, I don't know whatever happened to that piece of a Japanese wing. So anyway, uh, that that was the only the only time we ever got hit. We we had m many times that we would almost get hit, and I can remember many times that I used to see the ships, maybe three or four miles from us, be a couple of battleships, and they're fighting, shooting like crazy. And one day uh, I'm looking over that way, and I, I know the Tennessee's over there. And I can see all these Japs buzzing around them, and I see one going down on his starboard side. And all of his guns are, are shooting to the port side. So I don't know what happened. All the guys on the, on the starboard side must have been rubbernecking to watch what's going on on the other side. Of the mm -hmm. this, this Jap plane, I watched it. It flew right in and hit right into the bridge of the Tennessee. And uh, they had, I don't know, a, a lot, 10 or 15 guys were killed, and a, a bunch of them were were wounded. The guys who were topside, you know, most of them on gun mounts, they're, they're the ones that got killed by the kamikazes. But I remember seeing them. And, and then every now and then they'd come over our radio that, the, that the, the ships all had names, like Babe Ruth or Bing Crosby or a, a name, a, a nickname. And the so-and-so ship has just been hit by a kamikaze, blah, 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 blah. And they're, they, these were the picket ships. You ever heard of picket ships? Mm -hmm. They were out about maybe 30 or 40 miles from us, a, a ring of them, between us, between Okinawa and the mainland. And the Japs would come down through, and they're supposed to come down to Okinawa and, and try to get our troops. But instead of that, they were stopping where these picket ships were, and they were hitting them. And of course, many, many of them got shot down. But we lost 5,000 Navy guys in, the, in Okinawa just by... Mm -hmm. uh, by kamikazes. So we finally finished up that operation, and, and when they secured it, and, and, uh, uh, they, they, the operation was called secured, even though they th had some things afterwards. A lot of the Japanese committed suicide. But I now, don't, now, were you there for the big typhoon? Well, uh, Mike asked me the same question. I don't remember, but I, the, the big typhoon was more over in the Philippines. I can't remember really a bad storm when we were there. Okay. But the, Philipp the, the Philippine typhoon or hurricane, whatever you call it, my brother-in-law was a, on a destroyer there, and he said it was awful. Uh -huh. Three destroyers were sunk. You might know that. Mm -hmm. And it was determined that they were, they were low on fuel, and a destroyer has to have f fuel for ballast. Well, we, we, used to dis we used to fuel uh, destroyers at sea. You know, when they come alongside and we would mm -hmm. give them uh, oil or, wa or fresh water if they needed it. And oftentimes we give them food. And, and we would be, 
our captain insisted that we keep our sleeves rolled down. We had to have uniform of the day on, which was dungarees. We couldn't roll up our sleeves, even though we're out in the, in the Pacific. And these cans would come along, and they'd come alongside of us, and we'd be making headway, maybe 10 or 12 knots or whatever. And they're right alongside of us. It's kind of hairy watching them if the seas are heavy. Mm -hmm. And they'd, they'd string a, a uh, hose across and, and give them fuel oil. And we used to throw ice cream cups at them. And you see these guys on these destroyers with all, all kinds of raggedy clothes on. They'd have monkeys for, for mascots. And, and we envied those guys, really. And we used to just throw, throw ice cream cups at them. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. So finally, uh, I don't know how long you want to go on this, but finally, when the, when the war ended in Okinawa, they sent us back. We stopped in Saipan for a couple of days, and then we wound up back in Pearl Harbor. And we'd fired thousands, I think three or four thousand 14 inch shells at Okinawa. And so we go back to Pearl Harbor and they put us in a dry dock and on the side of the dock there was ten new gun barrels. So our, they determined that our gun barrels, are, they, get, they get worn and then the shells are not as accurate. And so they start to put all new guns on our ship in preparation for the invasion of uh, Japan which would have been in October of 45. And so there was a rest camp somewhere on Oahu, and every now and then they sent a couple of hundred of us guys. I went twice. Up, they put us on a train and take us up to this rest camp somewhere on the Oahu. I, I've been there, I've been there six times since the war, and I never found out where that was. But we went out there. They had some uh, barracks, and we had we slept in cots, and uh, there was right on, on the beach, and we could go swimming all day. We didn't have anything to do. You get up when you're ready, you eat when you're ready, all kinds of beer available, athletic fields. And we had a ball there for a week. And the second time I was there, when I was back aboard ship, they, each division, now they had, you got the first division, is, depending on the, the numbers or the turret, turret number one is first division. Each division had their own <coughs> softball team. And so the anti -air, we were anti-aircraft fire control, but we had our own team, anybody who wanted to be on it. And then the, fi the main battery fire control, they had their own battery. We're all fire controlmen, except we're on the anti-aircraft and they're on the main mm -hmm. battery. And so we go over to some athletic field on the submarine base. They take us over by, mo by whale boat, probably. And we always had beer with us. And so we play two or three games of uh, softball, and then we start drinking the beer. And I can remember several times that some of my buddies and I, we, we, we wouldn't go back to the ship. We'd just hang around and drink, make sure all the beer's gone. <laughs> and then we'd uh, go, we'd go we'd, we could walk back to the ship or go through the submarine base and get a bus or whatever. And we'd go back aboard the ship and uh, just, just go aboard. The war, is, yeah, the war ended well. The second time I was there, the word comes over that the, we had just dropped an atom bomb mm -hmm. on Japan. How did you feel about that when you heard about it? We that? were wonderful. We all celebrated. Mm -hmm. uh, because we figured that you know, it, it, it was devastating with that bomb killed all those poor Japanese. And so anyway, uh, w when we got back to the ship, we found out that virtually every ship in the harbor, Pearl Harbor, was firing their anti-aircraft guns up in the sky in celebration. Our, some, our, some of our guys did. Uh, I heard later that several people were damaged by the falling shrapnel. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, to try to get this thing over with, uh, uh, we, they stopped working on the ship. And the, the, the services came up with an idea they called Operation, I can't remember what it was, but they, they converted all the, they had all the ma major ships that were going back to the States take dischargees. And so they put, as I remember, or as I've read, they, they put about 600 guys aboard our ship, in, in addition to our 1,700 crew, and this, they sent us back to, to uh, Long Beach, California. And they slept on the deck, they slept any place they could find, but they're going home. These guys are at high points, and they're eligible to go back to the States and get discharged. The points were determined by how many months you've had in service and how many months in, 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 at sea and so forth. And so we, we pull into this harbor one morning, and uh, we could hear somebody singing. So... Uh, we, we pull up to this dock, and here's a woman on, on a, sitting on, on the back end of a of a platform truck, you know, a steak rack truck. It was Dinah Shore. 
So, God, that was fantastic. And so uh, she sang a lot of songs, and then we celebrated, and we got we got liberty. We stayed there for maybe a week, and then we picked up another thousand guys or whatever it was, and we took them back out to Pearl. And we were there for a few more days, and then they put on a thousand guys. But oh, by the time when we were in California, a lot of our guys had accumulated enough points so that they got sent to discharge stations to get off. So now we got some empty bunks. So they put on a thousand guys at Pearl Harbor, they're Marines and Navy, and we took a three-week trip down through the Panama Canal and up to New York City. And uh, I remember the morning we pulled into New York City going by the Statue of Liberty. It really gets you. And so uh, we, well, that was in October. And about a week after that, they had a big Navy Day parade in, the, in New York. And out in the Hudson River, we were anchored out there when the parade came along, and there was the Missouri was there, and the New York, and a couple of aircraft carriers, and the the day of the parade it was Navy Day, about October, I think it's Navy, October twelfth. <laughs> Here comes a destroyer coming up and down the river. He goes up one side and back down the other side. It was USS Renshaw, and who was on it? Harry Truman. Huh. And the, as the as the Renshaw went by the major ships, we all fired twenty one gun salutes. You know, blanks, of course, and so one of our guns fired 21 times, and the old Harry and his best are there. And they, it's great. So that anybody who wants to go in the parade can go on Liberty. Okay, so a whole gang of us went over, and we, they lined us up on one of the streets off of uh, Sixth Avenue, I think, as I recall. It was called it was, it was called Sixth Avenue at that time, and so they put us on a side street while the parade is forming, and the. Uh, we must have been there for an hour or more, so we used to sneak into the bars and get a couple of beers or what have you. So finally they'd pull our street out and we'd get into the tail end of the parade. This is how parades are formed. And so we marched down the 6th Avenue, which is now, I think it's called Boulevard of the Allies now. And then we could all go our way, so we went to, with all of our favorite haunts in Manhattan. So then I went home on leave for a, 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 a couple of times just for weekends. I could get on the train in New York and be in Oneida like it five hours or what four hours four hours so I went home on a couple of weekends and then I get a 10-day leave and my wife and I were just reviewing this the other day on my, my 10-day leave the first night so I honest I probably got home at night well the next night I decided to go up to the shady grill which is what where we used to hang out we were in high school it was a bar and when we were in high school, you, you could get drinks. I mean, when I was 17, I can remember going into the bars and getting beers. That mm -hmm. Nobody worried about you if you, didn't, if you weren't a wise guy. Mm -hmm. And so I go up to the Shady Grill all by myself. I hitchhiked up. And, uh, the, the, of course, the owner and the bartender, they, they all knew me, and I shot the breeze with them. And so I look into the dining room where they had a jukebox, and I see this table with a girl sitting there all alone. And so I walked in, and uh, I knew her from high school. And so she was a couple of years behind me. And so I just got shooting the breeze with her. And the first thing I know, somebody tapped me on the shoulder and says, you're sitting in my seat. And so she, she had been out dancing with her. The girls all danced together. Mm -hmm. And so it was Barbara, my wife. <laughs> and so I said, oh, I'm sorry. So uh, I could, well, she and I danced. And it was funny because uh, uh, she had her dad's car. And so I said, well, I don't have a car. I said, I, I hitchhiked up. And she said, well, I'll take you home. So I, I shouldn't maybe say this, but I'm going to anyway. I, 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 tell, I tell my friends that, yeah, she took me home. She took me to the White Star Cabins in Chittenango. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when we walked in, the guy says, oh, she, he says, hi, Barbara. Who's this guy you got with you now? <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that makes her mad because she knows I'm just kidding. And everybody knows I'm kidding. <laughs> But that was my story. But now she took me home, and then I dated her the rest of that 10-day leave, and then we wound up getting engaged and got married. When were you discharged? I was discharged the 16th of January, 1946. Did you uh, ever use the 5220 Club? I went home. I signed right up for it, 5220. Also, in New York State, we got some kind of a bonus, a two or $300 check. Mm -hmm. And I immediately signed up at Syracuse University, and I started... Uh, I, I worked part-time. My dad had a little company in those days, so I worked part-time for my dad, and then I started at Syracuse University. So you used the GI Bill also? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Now you said you're active in veterans organizations? American Legion. Mm -hmm. And you also stay in contact with some friends from... I have, I have some friends from, like I got a Christmas card from John Simpson yesterday, mm -hmm. and we used to see each other. He came to our wedding when we got married, and we used to see each other usually every summer. And we kind of drifted apart for one reason or another. He has a son that lives over in Switzerland and lives there, and so John and his wife go to Switzerland every year and just have a free month mm -hmm. with their son and daughter-in-law. All he has to pay for is the airfare. And so we don't get together like we used to. Mm -hmm. But the, the reunion is a big thing. I was going to say, how many times have you gone to reunions? Well, we've gone over 20 times, 21 or 2. And we have a reunion every year. And every year it's someplace different, and it's whoever runs it. Now, for years, people would compete to run it. Like I'd say, let's run it in Buffalo, and you'd say, no, we're going to run it in Cleveland or whatever. And we'd show brochures and what have you, just mm -hmm. like a, an election. Mm -hmm. And then they'd take a vote, and whoever got the most vote had the reunion. And that was, that was normally, it used to be three years hence. But now we're down to, sometimes we're lucky if we have a guy to do it next year. Although this year we got a guy last year that signed up for two years later. Uh, and, and so we've been all over, we're twice to California with St. Louis. Uh, well, Barb and I ran it in Buffalo, we ran it in Cincinnati. And last year we ran it in, uh, or a year ago, we ran it in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And whoever runs the reunion makes all the arrangements. And they arrange all the, uh, what you're going to do, like when we had it in Valley Forge, we went and saw the uh, USS New Jersey, which is over in Camden. And we went, went aboard and we had our memorial service where they salute the dead and throw the, the uh, wreath in, and play taps. We always do that. Mm -hmm. We've done that in Texas, where the USS Texas is set up. That was our sister ship. The state of Texas took over the, the ship, and that's, the, that's, their, that's a, one of their major museums now in the, mm -hmm. in the state of Texas. In Alabama, in Mobile, the USS Alabama is there, and that's the biggest drawing park in the state of Alabama. Mm -hmm. We had a reunion there one year. Now you, you donated a flag from the battleship. How I did brought, you end I up brought with that? A, I've had this flag. I don't know where I got it, but I've had it for years, and nobody knows where it came from. But it, it's tattered and torn. It was from your ship. It was from the ship, and as I told Mike, uh, there's two more. Uh, one of them, one of them, we gave we gave this. Uh, Cardinal Spellman came aboard our ship in Pearl Harbor. I showed him a picture of that uh -huh. in here. Cardinal Spellman came aboard the ship. This the war was over, and the. Uh, they gave him a flag, and he was going to take it back and put it on display in the cathedral, you know, the main cathedral. Right. And so uh, I've been there a couple of times, and I couldn't find it. And one time I was looking for it, and somebody says, go down to such and such an office and inquire. So I went down to that office, and they said, you have to write a letter to so-and-so. So I wrote a letter to so-and-so. We have our own letterheads. And I told him I was from the USS New York and that we'd given this flag to Carlos uh -huh. Feldman to come back to the cathedral. I know at times it was shown because I've had some guys tell me they'd seen it. But I never got a reply from the guy. Huh. So now, well, this flag thing just came up recently from, from our last reunion. This guy is from Brooklyn and he said he's going to go down there and really try to find out where it is. Now that flag would have been brand new probably. Uh -huh. This one they say was the flag we flew when we were probably in Okinawa. And there's one of our shipmates lives in California, and he has a flag, and he doesn't know where it came from. <coughs> so what I did with Mike up here, I said, I'm not going to give it to you. I said, I'd like to loan it to you. Mm -hmm. And then when I find out for sure that our crew wants to, give, wants to do away with it, I'm sure that if anybody doesn't want this flag to go on display, it's crazy. Okay? So I, I left it with Mike. I'll let him know shortly what... what what, what, what the consensus of opinion is uh -huh. with our fellows. He said he'd really like to have it. Yeah. He said yeah, since this is a state military museum, exactly. and that's New York. And it's USS, USS New York. York. Well, did I tell you about the, the reason the, the ship, well, there's a new, a new New York is being built right now in New, in New Orleans. And uh, the ship was planned, it's a, what they call an APD, which is a, a assault ship. The, the assault ships are big. It's bigger than uh -huh. my battleship was. And they take a, like a brigade or whatever of Marines and landing craft and, and helicopters on attacks. This is what, uh -huh. they, what they're doing now. And so there's a whole bunch of them being built. It's the San Antonio class, 
and our ship is due for commissioning in 19 or 2007. And uh, I've, been, but I've been in contact with a man from the Navy League, which I belong to, and uh, he's, he's in charge of the Navy League in the Northeast. And, and he, he, well, I read in the paper that the New York, the new New York, will be commissioned in in, Long, in Manhattan. Hmm. And this admiral confirmed that the Navy League will be there, and he says whatever crew you can get will be guests of honor. So uh, I'm I'm hoping that uh, that uh, a number of us are still alive and well enough. I'll plan a reunion for that date, mm -hmm. and so we'll, we'll we'll call that our this year's reunion, and we'll we'll get hotel rooms somewhere. We can I'm sure we can get a deal somewhere that mm -hmm. we can afford, mm -hmm. and that we'll be a bit there for the commissioning in New York. Probably in 2007. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, and, and when, the, when, the, when the Navy agreed to call it to New York, the governor was there. And it, happened, it, was, big, it was big news at the time, and, and the Navy announced that the, the, the Secretary of the Navy, I think his name is England, and they agreed that this ship would be called the USS New York. And also, it's going to contain a lot of the, uh, the iron from the 9-11. Uh, uh, the buildings that were uh -huh. torn down. Uh -huh. A lot of that steel was sent somewhere, and whatever whatever they do with it, and, and, that, and that's formed, I think that they call it the prow of the ship. Uh -huh. So there will be several, I don't know how many tons of, of scrap metal from 9-11 that will be in, in that ship. Uh -huh. Which is kind of interesting. So that's what's brought this whole thing into the fore. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I got here to see you folks yes. today. Okay, well, thank you very much for your thank interview. You. Now, the reason we're in town is that one of my son's wife's father just died. He uh -huh. lived down here in Balta. And so uh, we got over here for the 9.30 funeral. Mm -hmm. And uh, we left home at 7. And then we went to the, to the uh, National Cemetery where he was buried. Mm -hmm. they had a, that's a beautiful mm -hmm. place. Yes, it is. I had never even heard about mm -hmm. it.